Well, good morning. We are going to dive into our Sunday school hour, um, and we are going to continue in our study through systematic theology. So we are in bibliology, if you recall. Um, Carrie started us out last week, um, and we'll review a little bit about that, and then we'll dive into uh, the new topics we're planning to cover. So um, if you'll pray with me, um, we'll uh, get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have again this morning to look into your word. We ask that you would give us um, insight to see who you are more clearly, to see what you've revealed about your word, that it is true. And Lord, we ask for your help. I pray, Lord, that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, uh, that you would help me to get out of the way and just see your word shine through. Lord, we love you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we started into bibliology, and we talked about inspiration, authority, and inerrancy. And Carrie did an excellent job going through defining these terms for us and seeing what Scripture says in regards to them. Inspiration, kind of talking about the process of how God inspired his word. He used human authors, but he superintended or um, used them, but he was ultimately the author. That's why when we look at the Bible, we say this is God's word, Right? And because it's God's word, there are some implications, and two of those that he covered for us was one, that um, it comes with divine authority, and secondly, that it comes with divine accuracy. So that's a nice, cute way of putting them all, you know, with the same title of letters, author, authority, and accuracy, but the terminology used is inspiration, authority, and inerrancy. And we mentioned kind of a key verse for bibliology that we'd love for you guys to take time to memorize and um, commit to memory is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So if you would read it out loud with me, we'll do that together. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Today we're going to be covering three different topics. We'll be covering the clarity of Scripture. We'll be covering the... Wow. <laughs> I just had a lapse in my brain real quick. Necessity of Scripture. Sorry about that. And the sufficiency of Scripture. Okay? So clarity, there's this big term um, called perspicuity. So if you heard someone say they want to talk about or have questions about the perspicuity of Scripture... Um, perspicuity just means clarity, but it's not very clear. So we just say the clarity of Scripture is typically um, the doctrine that we refer to. So some questions that we want to kind of put our, our thinking on the tracks as we come into analyze texts of Scripture that speak to this. Um, questions that come up in regards to the clarity of Scripture. This is a doctrine that is, has been attacked in the past and is continuing to be under attack even in our current day and age. So some questions are, are we really able to understand Scripture? Do we need Bible scholars to understand the Bible rightly? Do we need someone else to interpret the Bible on our behalf? And lastly, is the meaning of Scripture found in the reader or the text itself? Historically, um, the Catholic Church has had a position that, that someone needs to interpret Scripture for the people, that it's only for them to interpret and you need to obey and follow the church's interpretation. And in our day and age, we are under a different attack of postmodernism. Postmodernism wants to say that the interpretation belongs to the individual and they look at the text, and if it means something to them, then that's the right meaning of the text. So the clarity of Scripture is what's under attack in both of those situations. Wayne Grudem defines for us the definition of the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture. It says the clarity of Scripture means that the Bible is written in such a way that its teachings are able to be understood by all who read it, seeking God's help and being willing to follow it. So this morning I thought it'd be fun to kind of do a little experiment test case on the clarity of Scripture. Um, as I was studying one of the challenges to really um, investigate if the clarity of Scripture is true or not was just read it. Like just try to read God's Word 
and dive in and see what happens. You'll find out if the clarity of Scripture is real or not. So what we're going to do this morning is just that. We're going to look at some Scripture texts together, and hopefully in your notes, feel free to write down these passages and review them later. But my hope is for us to come away with the impression of Scripture testifies to itself that it is clear. Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 119, 130 says, The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Psalm 119, 105, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In these scripture verses, it's, it's clear that scripture is described as a light. It's something that's supposed to guide us and direct us. It's also talking about making wise the simple or imparts understanding to the simple. And this word simple in our text actually doesn't just merely mean someone who lacks intelligence or understanding, but it even indicates the lack of sound judgment. And it's able to make that type of person wise. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, right before our key verses, reads, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Deuteronomy 6 uh, verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord was getting attention to all his people, not just Moses or Aaron or the leaders of Israel, but he's talking to all his people and he expected all of them to listen and obey. And then further he gives the instructions, he says, And these words I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So these passages in Scripture are making it clear that that this is not a book that's supposed to be unattainable even for children to understand. And that we're commanded as anybody, whether you're a Bible scholar or a commonplace person, to understand what God has communicated to us. There's a responsibility there as well to teach your children, and to do it throughout the day. It was expected that they would know it, that they would teach it, and that they would apply it to their daily lives. If we continue reading some other texts in Matthew, it's interesting when you read through the Gospels, when Jesus was interacting with people, whether it was uh, Mary and Martha or um, his disciples or even the Pharisees, his response was never, oh, I I see how the Old Testament was a little confusing and how it wasn't very clear. Um, let Let me help clarify some things for you. Instead, what we see Jesus repeating over and over again is, have you not read? Have you never read? And in Matthew 22, 9, it says, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Jesus never indicated the Old Testament was some sort of cryptic language that had to be decoded so that we would understand it. But he said, have you read? Have you, have you read the Old Testament? You should know this. Another point of emphasis in regards to the clarity of Scripture um, is we see testimony of the early church. In Acts 17, 11, he says, Now the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and this is referring to the Bereans, and it says, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these writings were so. So what's interesting here is the early church was being written these letters and being told to read the Old Testament, because that's all they had at that point, right? So they're reading, these Gentile believers are reading about Abraham, which in their day and age would have been 2,000 years before their time, right? Right? So there's this distance of change, culture, time, and they're expecting them to read the Old Testament, to study it, to see if what's being told and taught is true. That was their measuring tool, their barometer. In 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We need to study to ensure that we understand scripture. There's a responsibility on us, but it's Also, because it's clear. Even in Romans chapter 1, it talks about how we know the truth and we suppress it, right? And when we suppress it, it's because we know it's true, but we don't want to believe it. And that's why we're culpable, is the term, or accountable for the truth that we've been given. And we suppress the knowledge of the truth. 
It is understandable. So the question is, if, if, okay, I'm tracking with you, we went through all these passages, it is pretty clear, like, we should be able to understand what Scripture says, but in our experience, there's lots of misunderstanding, right? Um, Historically, in the church, there's been lots of doctrinal disagreement, and it's slow to be, if, when it can be, reconciled. And even today, there's disagreements on certain doctrines. So why do people misunderstand Scripture? And how does that really conflate or combine with this idea of the clarity of Scripture? Well, one of the verses that would answer this question is in Luke 24, 5. Um, Jesus said that they didn't understand because of the lack of faith and a hardness of heart. Um, And in Acts 15, there's an example where Peter and Paul were debating over, hey, what are the implications of Gentile believers now being brought in? Like, do they have to follow Jewish tradition? How does this all work? And there was um, a debate over that between them. But what we need to understand is in these issues of understanding Scripture, really the problem is not with God's Word. It's not God's Word that becomes unclear because we have a problem with it. The problem is actually with ourselves. The clarity of Scripture shouldn't be questioned because we don't understand something. The problem would be with our finite, fallen understanding. And that's why I wanted to bring up a couple terms in regards to how we study God's word. And that's really important for us to understand as we kind of go through systematic theology. And these are tools that we should all have as believers. Um, Fancy words aren't always needed, but the understanding of what they mean can be applied to our daily lives. And two of these terms are hermeneutics and exegesis. Hermeneutics is simply the study of the correct methods of interpretation of scripture. These would be referred to as the principles of interpretation. So what are you know, the boundary lines, what are the guardrails we have for how we read God's word and understand what its meaning is. And exegesis is more the process of interpreting a text of scripture. So when you're applying your hermeneutic principles and begin explaining a text, you're doing exegesis. And the opposite would be called eisegesis. So ex as in exit, you're, you're reading what's coming out of the text versus eisegesis is you're reading into, you're going into the text to say, I think I know something to be true, and I'm going to read a text, and I'm going to find a way for it to say what I want it to say. That's eisegesis. So these are some some tools that we use in regards to how we study scripture, and specifically when we talk about a hermeneutic or interpretation, we would use the terms contextual, literal, historical, and grammatical. So contextual just means we don't just rip things out of context. We want to read it in the context it was written. So if we miss the story going on and we just take something out of the middle of it and say, this is what this means, it should mean the same thing in the, in the narrative or in the Psalms or in the history or wisdom literature, whatever it was, it should fit into the context, not be like, this puzzle piece doesn't fit here, but it, it sounds great when it's put out here. Literally, it's just reading scripture as it was written. So if it's narrative, we read it as it's narrative. If it's poetic literature, we read it as it's poetry. So what was the intent of the original author. Historical also means we don't take our 21st century culture context and overlay it on passages of scripture and say, well, today in age when we say um, a a woman cutting their hair short, that means a certain thing. But what did it mean back then? It means something different then. So we need to understand when we look at the text of scripture what it meant in its historical context. And then grammatical being the fourth one saying we, we actually care about the words. So, you know, if I tell my kids, um, go clean your bedroom, and I come back, you know, three minutes later, and they are eating a bowl of ice cream, well, I, th- I thought you meant go eat some ice cream. Like, no, that's not what I said. Uh, you can literally look at the words, and it didn't mean that. So um, the actual words matter. And those are kind of some of the guardrails in regards to interpreting Scripture. So some phrases that maybe you've heard people use or even... I, myself, or us are guilty of using is, um, you've heard the phrase, a deeper meaning. When people are reading, I think there's a deeper meaning here. Or, um, this is what it means to me. Or, we need to bring the Bible into modern times. It's actually the opposite. Uh, I think John MacArthur, I was listening to a video this week, and he said, um, we don't need to bring the Bible into modern times, but we need to bring modern people into Bible times. It's, it's the opposite. We need the context of what Scripture actually teaches, and we need to do that correctly first. 
And part of it is we get confused between interpretation and application. Those are probably familiar terms, but we really get that messed up, and we want to skip interpretation and go straight to application. And we're just, if you don't do the legwork up front, you're in huge danger. And sometimes you might fall within the guardrails of, yeah, that's true, but what are you implying? If you're willing to just say something that's true but provable elsewhere and just put it on this text, you're going to fall into bigger potholes later. Um, so it's really important to kind of nail down um, a hermeneutic tools that we use to interpret Scripture correctly because it's clear, um, but obvi- obviously there's times where we often get it wrong. If it wasn't clear or if it was true that we needed to find a deeper meaning and what it means to us, that would really make Scripture just a bunch of riddles. It would be riddles that we were hopeless to understand, and we're just kind of throwing darts at a wall, hoping, hoping that it hits in the right place. So um, as kind of a, uh, an example, I like Rubik's Cubes, and whenever I explain a Rubik's Cube, the first thing I ever tell to anybody is that the centers never move. I don't know if you know that, but the orange center is always opposite the red center. And the yellow center is always opposite the white and the green and the blue, right? So if the centers never move, there has to be a baseline for us to understand. And what we need to remember is that when God wrote his word, he intended something at that time when he wrote it. And if we come away with something different than what he intended when he wrote his word, then it's wrong. We have to have that baseline. Otherwise, you get a much more confusing puzzle when you don't have a center. And it's really harder to solve it because you don't have a baseline for your interpretation. Okay? So, now I got my toys put away. All right. So, some no's or what we're not implying by the doctrine of the clarity of Scripture. We are not implying that all passages of Scripture are equally clear as to its precise meaning. We're not saying the clarity of Scripture means everything is equally on the same level, playing field of precise meaning and understanding. We're also not saying that the teaching of Scripture is everywhere equally simple. Uh, Peter actually references Paul's writings and says this is hard to understand. But what he didn't say was Paul's writings are impossible to understand. And we need to remember that the interpretation of Scripture takes work. Like, we actually are responsible to understand it, but it's not a lack of lifting or effort. Um, it's, in our day and age, we're, we're much more susceptible to wanting the convenience of the immediate. We like fast food, and it just got faster with mobile ordering. Don't have to wait and drive through very long. I mean, we want immediate response. We want to stream something on our phone. But when it comes to God's words, it's like, ah, oh, that is, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of time. I'd rather somebody spoon feed me. But really, our goal as a believer in general, no matter what, where you fall in regards to um, intellectual ability or not, is you are responsible before God to know what he has written to you and what he has said about himself. The interpretation, explanation, and exposition by a Bible teacher is never necessary. We're not implying that either. Scripture has given um, us indication through spiritual gifts of preaching and teaching that those are gifts for the church to edify the believers. But it's better to kind of consider more the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. His description is, how how can I understand without a guide? He doesn't say, how do I understand without an interpreter? But a guide walks with you. They're, They're alongside you saying, what do you see? Oh, yeah, I see that. Do you see how this mixes with that? And that, that's indicating the same message. Whereas an interpreter says, I'm going to stand between you and what this is, and I'm going to tell you what it is, but you don't look at it. I'm, I'm going to look at it for you, and then I'll tell you what to think about it. That's, that's the difference between the two. And it's important for us to understand that these are, uh, that's not an implication. We, we need and benefit from Bible scholars and teachers and are blessed with a surplus of knowledge, and especially in our day and age, that we should value, but we are still responsible to know. And like the Bereans, we need to take that information and test it against what Scripture says and not just have a steady diet of being spoon-fed. Also, um, what we're not trying to indicate is that Bible doctrines are everywhere stated with equal clarity. Um, There are different levels of clarity. Some things are plain as day. The holiness of God is not confusing. It is all over Scripture explicitly. But it probably takes a little more work to understand the Trinity. It takes more work, but it's there, and it's taught. And we have to look at Scripture and say, what is taught about this subject 
and believe what God has said is true. So what are we saying with the clarity of Scripture? We're saying that Scripture is clear enough for the simplest person to live by. Scripture is clear in its essential matters. The obscurity that a reader of the Bible may find in some parts of Scripture is the fault of a finite and sinful mankind, not of Scripture. Even an unsafe person can understand the plain teachings of Scripture on an external level. And I wanted to talk about this briefly because in our introduction lesson, we mentioned that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 about it, Scripture has to be spiritually discerned, right? The unspiritual can't understand it, but there is clarity in the sense that you can't walk away from reading the Gospels and think that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Like that's, It's clear that they say that's what happened and that he states he, that he rose again. And he said that he would do that. Like, there's a clarity even to Scripture from an external level of just historical facts. And that's why, you know, C.S. Lewis says, you know, Jesus claimed to be Lord. There's, whether you believe that or not, it doesn't matter. He claims to be Lord. So he's either a liar, he's not what he says he is, or he's a lunatic, he thinks he's something that he's not, or he actually is what he says he is, he's Lord. Like, things like that are clear to an external audience, and they need to be told that message. But there is clarity to Scripture in that its, its messages are often understandable even from just a, a factual statement level. But we also need to understand with the clarity of Scripture that the Holy Spirit must illumine the mind of the reader or the hearer to obtain the meaning of what is being said. Um, this week I heard it said this way, that Scripture, the, the, God's Word is not just... Um, the, the written scripture, but it's the meaning of what God's communicated. Again, if, if we don't know what God meant by something, we get the wrong meaning, we're not getting scripture. We're not getting God's word. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us understand the real meaning of what God is communicating. If we have words that are saying something, but it's misinterpreted, the communication's not happening. We're, we're blocking it off due to our fault, not God's. So the clarity of scripture is clear. In summary, some thoughts that I think are important for us to reflect on is, are you grateful for the clearness of God's word? Are you grateful? This is a grace to us. I mean, finite man trying to understand an infinite God, yet he intentionally thought through how to communicate these eternal attributes of himself and his redemptive history of reconciling the holiness and justice of God with his forgiveness for sinners like us who can't earn it. I mean, that's, that's amazing that he would do that for us. Personally, do you study God's word? Do you spend time? Are you diligent to study scripture? Or are you content with being fed what others tell you is true about it? Do you rely on others? Or do you study it also for yourself? Do you know how to properly study scripture? And I would just say, this isn't um, a shaming question at all. This is an inviting question. Like, we do this, we're talking about this because we want to dispense the tools of studying scripture this is supposed to be an enabling thing. So honestly, it's a, it's a real question without any sort of inhibitions or hesitations. Like if you don't know, please come ask me, come ask JD, um, come ask others in our church who have spent time to formulate these tools and come up with a process to understand scripture because we want you to study it. We want you to read it and experience the clarity, and we want you to ultimately see who God is more clearly and grow in Christ-likeness. That's, that's the whole purpose of these tools. So moving on from the clarity, we have um, discussed the clarity of Scripture, but we also want to cover uh, the necessity of Scripture. Some questions to kind of get our brains thinking about this topic of necessity. Do we need to know what the Bible says and to know, to know that God exists. Do we need to know what the Bible says to know that we are sinners in need of salvation? Or for what purpose is Scripture necessary? So if we say we need something, well, what do we need it for, right? We would agree and probably, you know, if we're here today and listening and Christians, we're like, yeah, of course I need God's Word. Like, next slide, next topic, we get it. But we need to understand what Scripture says it's necessary for and what it's not. So the definition of necessity of Scripture is that it means that the Bible is necessary for knowledge of the gospel, for maintaining spiritual life, and for certain knowledge of God's will. But it is not necessary for knowing that God exists or for knowing something about God's character and moral laws. 
So let's look at some passages of Scripture together to see the testimony of it. Romans chapter 10, 13 through 17 says, For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So the indication that Paul's kind of logically going through here is he's trying to say there's a message that has to be told. You either need to hear the gospel or you need to read the gospel. And the message is in God's word. He has communicated it to us. There's a need to know the gospel and it comes from God's word. John 3:18 says whoever believes in him is not condemned referring to Christ. But whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These verses are indicating that there's an exclusivity, right? We need God's word to know the message of the gospel. To be saved, we must know that Jesus came and died for our sins and rose again on the third day and promises eternal life for all those who receive him by faith, who repent and believe and trust in him. There's a necessity for that specific aspect. And today, the reason you, we're talking about this, and you're probably thinking, well, does anybody disagree with that? I mean, why, why is that an issue? There's a position called inclusivism, which if you haven't heard of it, basically says um, all roads lead to heaven. You know, as long as you sincerely follow the religion of wherever you live, Jesus' atoning work on the Christ counts toward you, even if you don't know Jesus at all. That's inclusivism. It's saying you don't need God's word. You just need to have a sincere heart. Same with universalism. Universalism is, is all dogs go to heaven. You know, we don't need God's word. It's everybody's going to go there. It's just a big funnel. We're all just kind of waiting our way down, and we're all going to get to go to heaven. So there are positions that are promoted and in, in, And you will be challenged by it as you try to witness to people. They'll be like, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, the gospel's great. That's fantastic. But I'm totally in disagreement with it, and I think this is true. But we'll end up at the same place when it's all said and done. And you need to be able to discern what's going on here and what they're not believing about Scripture so that you can show them clearly from God's Word. It's not what God's Word says. And I think God's Word is the authority. Will you take time to consider these truths? Some other verses in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, address kind of a question that often comes up. is like, well, what about the saints in the Old Testament? They didn't know who Jesus was. How did they receive faith if, or were they not saved? Because, you know, Jesus hadn't come and died yet. How were they saved? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 indicates for us that these all died in faith, talking about the saints from the Old Testament, not having received the things promised, But having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Jesus even says in John John chapter 8, verse 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Faith and repentance is the same message of salvation from Genesis through Revelation. And in the Old Testament, although they didn't know every detail, what they knew was God's promise. God had promised right at the fall, there's the first promise of salvation, and that he would send a seed through her seed. There would be redemption for God's people to bring them back into right relationship with him. And that's the promise that gets expounded all the way through the Old Testament and climaxes with Jesus' incarnation and provision of salvation and coming to dwell among his people and provide salvation for his people. So the Old Testament saints were saved in the same way. Continuing on um, in regards to the necessity of Scripture, what we need for spiritual life, Jesus, when he was tempted, said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's interesting, Jesus doesn't just bat away Satan and say, get real. I'm God, I don't, I don't need anything. 
Uh, this isn't anything to me. But he responds with scripture, showing the necessity of it, and there's a passage that literally is saying, this is what we need. What we need is um, a steady diet of God's word. We need to trust in God, and that is going to be our sword in spiritual warfare as well. So for our spiritual life, that's what we need. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. It's interesting that in this text, there's the idea that there are certain things we're not going to know. There are certain things that we don't get to know. But what God's written in his word is for us to know, and we need to know it. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. There's, again, a consistent diet, a need to meditate on and to know God's word. And there's blessing that comes with that. Psalm 119.1 says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And he's tying together these ideas. How can one be blameless unless we know God's word? Carrie last week um, told us about these two topics of general revelation and specific revelation and kind of line-itemed out for us what uh, the differences are. But I want to just display for you quickly a, a tool that I got Um, from when I went through systematic theology that helps kind of show the parallel yet distinction between God's revelation of himself through creation and through our consciences, as Roman ones talk about, and through specific revelation, which would be God's written word. General revelation is given to all, and specific revelation is given to some. General revelation is sufficient to condemn We see that we are sinners through creation. We know that through our conscience. Yet specific revelation is sufficient to save. So we have to have it to receive the good news of the gospel. General revelation declares God's greatness, while specific revelation declares God's grace. General revelation can be seen through creation and the conscience, and specific is through Christ. As Hebrew 1 talks about, in, in, in the past, there was many ways that the Lord communicated, but now he's revealed himself through his son, through Jesus Christ. So in summary, on the necessity of scripture, do you treasure scripture as if it is necessary for your spiritual life? I mean, practically speaking, what is the investment or the heart level desire of getting into God's word for you? Do you actually treasure and need God's word for spiritual life, or is it kind of optional? I think it's a challenge when times come up that are difficult. Um, I feel like I'm going through one of those right now, personally. It's like, do I go to um, somebody to spoon feed me? Do I go to counselors of other godly men that I trust? Or is my primary need to actually be in God's word, to trust him and to commune with him and to have him speak to me? It's important for our spiritual life. Do you share scripture with others who need the good news? I think oftentimes we get into this idea of evangelism that's tied up in uh, merely a testimony. You know, share the gospel and use words if you have to. Maybe you've heard that. The scripture is necessary for salvation. It is the power unto salvation is how Paul writes it in Romans. Are you certain of what promises God has made to you? When you struggle with insecurities and uncertainties, We can know for certain what God's will is. It doesn't mean that you get to know every detail of every decision, but God has clearly spoken to us through his word and what we are to do in many ways, and we often don't even know. We just don't take the time to know. Do you believe in the necessity, and are you committed to living out practically what that looks like? And then lastly, we're going to talk about the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture. So some questions to get us on these guardrails would be, should we expect new revelation from God? Is the Bible just for normal people? But for severe problems, it it really isn't enough to help. I mean, if I've really got issues, um, if somebody's, you know, you're counseling and somebody talks to you about how they're struggling with cutting or anorexic, does God's word really help that? Or, you know, if you're just really stressed out about your job, then 
don't be anxious for anything, but with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. You know, there's, there's some simplistic ideas that we can apply, but when it's really difficult, the Bible's not really enough to help with those issues. Is scripture enough for knowing what God requires us to believe or to do? These are questions that um, the sufficiency of scripture is going to address. So our definition is the sufficiency of scripture means that scripture contained all the words of God he intended his people to have at each stage of redemptive history, and that it now contains everything we need God to tell us for salvation, for trusting him perfectly, and for obeying him perfectly. So let's look again at some scripture together to see what scripture testifies to be true about itself in regards to sufficiency of scripture. 2 Timothy 3.15 And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, speaking of scripture again, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So Paul's indicating to Timothy, even in referencing Timothy's own testimony, that scripture was to make him wise for salvation. It was necessary for salvation. Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Walking in purity requires us to know God's word. How about 2 Timothy 3.17? Again, maybe you've heard 2 Timothy 3 a lot. That's why it's one of our key verses, even from 14 through 17. It says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And then if you would turn with me to 2 Peter Second Peter chapter 1. And this is one of the primary texts, um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, talk about how um, God inspired his word, and we'll get to that, but I want to start with verse 16. And just as a reminder, Peter is writing this letter, and he experienced some amazing things in going through ministry with Jesus, and... He was even at the Mount of Transfiguration when that event happened. So thinking about that, let's read, starting in verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, talking about that moment of transfiguration, this amazing, spectacular, spiritual event that he experienced. And in verse 19 he says, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. So he's saying in comparison to this magnificent event that he saw happen with his own eyes, He's saying we have something better, better than that, better than a new revelation or when we pray and say, Lord, I just need you to just audibly speak to me to tell me exactly what to do. We have something better in the prophetic word, more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all. That no scripture, or excuse me, no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that the events that Peter experienced, and he's so clearly stating, God's word is better. God's word is better. And oftentimes we want more. We look for more. And we see this in different parts of the evangelical church. That we desire something else. But it's clear even throughout history when we speak of sola scriptura. Right? It doesn't mean solo or I think the word would be nuda scriptura. Like scripture alone and that's it. Chuck everything out. But it's saying that scripture alone is the highest authority that we compare everything else to. We don't want to forsake all the scholarship and teaching and research that's been done, but we want to make sure that it matches up with what God's word says and that we value it highly and we see it as sufficient for our needs. 
So some application points for us in regards to the sufficiency of Scripture or implications would be, um, and from Deuteronomy and Revelation both state this explicitly, but we should not add or subtract to God's Word. If God's Word is sufficient, it doesn't need us to say, well, this isn't very clear, so let's just add this little part here and help tidy it up. Or other parts, that this doesn't seem very relevant today. This doesn't seem like it'll land well based on the context we're in, so let's just leave that part out. Let's skip that part. Let's, let's cut it out. We should not do that, and Scripture warns us to not do that. We also see that all Scripture is profitable. Again, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That means that Scripture is relevant today. And when our hearts doubt that, what we're doubting is the sufficiency of Scripture. When we feel like, I don't know that this really is relevant or how how this can really help us today. It doesn't seem to really fit anywhere or it's it's really not going to land well. I don't think it's going to be received well. It's not true. And we need to make sure that we're not doubting the sufficiency of God's word. We need to remember to open our Bibles. I think our greatest danger would be to stop opening our Bibles. I mean, if stuff goes south really fast, we need God's Word, right? We need God's Word. We don't need a church building. We don't need all this exterior type stuff. What we need is God's Word, and we need to trust Him to open your Bibles. Do you believe that the Word of God is sufficient to do the work of God? How you answer that question will, will dictate the amount of spiritual life that you will have in your communion with the Lord. God's Word is clear, God's Word is needed, and God's Word is enough. Next week, we're going to continue in our study through bibliology. We're going to do bibliology part three, you could call it. And J.D. is going to take us through the preservation, the canonicity, and the transmission translation of Scripture. So with that, I don't even have time for questions. But hopefully, if you have questions, please come up to us afterward. Um, We'd love to answer those questions, and maybe we'll take some of those. And if there's time, or we'll do a fourth lesson where we can kind of have Um, opportunity to engage some of those questions and make sure we're answering those as well. But other than that, you're dismissed.